and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. In our opinion, of course, I'm Brad Heineck, and uh, we're just absolutely delighted to have Chris, the pharmacist, with us. Hey, guys. Uh, we've got a wonderful podcast today. Or, you know, you can see it on YouTube as well, uh, but it's amoxicillin, how and when we use it, plus dangers of overuse, which is definitely out there, and it's it's something that we, it's good to know. Oh, yeah. I mean, amoxicillin, it is one of the most widely prevalent drugs used in the world. Uh, in the United States, 2017, it was pretty much number 18 on the list at 27 million prescriptions filled. So it's a big in number. In the United States. In the USA. You know it. 27 million. 27 million scripts. Okay. So it's a lot. Yeah. It's a so lot. it's being used out there? It is being used. It's an essential drug. I mean, the WHO, I mean, it's, it's an essential medication. They have it on hand. I mean, it, it treats a variety of different infections. And, and so how long has it been around? Yeah, well, it's uh, amoxicillin, uh, isolated in 1958, but uh, first used uh, in 1972. But, I mean, penicillin itself, we go back a little bit further. Well, know, what's penicillin got to do with amoxicillin? Well, amoxicillin is a penicillin. So it's just a, Yeah, it's just a version of it. Okay. So it's a more readily available version. Yep. But, I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of crazy. There's a doctor, Alexander Fleming, in 1928, mm. uh, just came back from vacation in England. And uh, he went back to his lab, and it was a mess. So he started to clean things up, and he noticed that his agar dishes, that his, all his staph infections, had this mold on there. Yeah. And it was penicillium uh, notatum. And so basically around that area, there was no bacteria growth. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. So he looked at it in a microscope to make sure it was a little bit more clear. He's like, wow, it is not there. And at that point, he had realized he had probably come up with probably the single most greatest medical revolution in, in the history of mankind, which was the discovery of penicillin. So in 28... And they, got some mold, it killed some bacteria, you know, exactly. went on from there. Well, and then it kind of just sort of died. He was he was a researched physician, and he was brilliant. He actually came up with a couple of things along the way. But um, 10 years later, another doctor at Oxford read his paper, uh, yeah. and so and just so his name was Howard Florey. And so he, he was at the William and Dunn uh, College of Pathology and Medicine, and he just thought this, and he was, he was a rainmaker. So this guy would go out and just make money. So he found this and he goes, I think we can probably make some money with yeah. this. So he got in contact with the doctor and he they basically started to work on it. So he had a big lab group in the Oxford uh, department that he worked in. And so there was Dr. Ernst Chain. And then another player was uh, Dr. Norm Healy, who was a biochemist. So they came up together to they make penicillin? Well, it was kind of a process. So they started working on it, and it was really, really hard to isolate. Um, and so it, as a matter of fact, when they got down to it, it took 2,000 liters of extract to treat one human being. So can you imagine 2,000 one-liter bottles? I mean, it would fill up this room. Yeah. I mean, it's it's huge yeah. to treat one person. So so we can get on to amoxicillin. So this all developed in the 50s, and then we got no. penicillin? Well, yeah, actually, well, what happened is this is World War II, actually, is when this was happening. World War II England. So they're getting bombed out by the Germans all the time. Yeah. And so they had a guy that had a gardening accident was pretty wicked, um, and he was – dying because of this horrible staph infection. Yeah. And so they were like, well, we just did a, tri a trial on 50 mice a little while ago. Yeah. 25 that were treated with penicillin lived. They're like, let's try it on this dude. And so basically they gave this guy penicillin and they had enough to give him for five days. Yeah. And so basically they gave it to him. He was recovering and then they couldn't get any more because they couldn't make it. And this is, uh, so they're actually taking his urine because it was very strongly metabolized by the kidney yeah. and re-isolating it out of his urine, but they couldn't make enough. And that's where this Dr. Heatley comes into play. He's actually probably, he's the one that, in this hospital, he took every bottle, bedpan, anything he could put in it to try and grow this penicillin isolate. But unfortunately, it ran out of time, and sadly, uh, the poor individual passed away. Oh. 
But so they were like, what do we do next? And so it's 1941, middle of World War II. They can't do anything in Europe because they're getting bombed yeah. uh, to bejesus. Mm -hmm. And so they came to the United States, ended up in Peoria. Um, they talked to several different manufacturers. And there was this Dr. A.J. Moyer that this Heatley guy came in contact with. He made a couple of quick suggestions. They changed the type of mold substance they used for penicillin. Sure. And they got the extract. And by 42, it was being made by you know, billions upon billions of units. And so they had it. Uh, 1942, the first American person used it. A young lady that had a very sepsis uh, due to a miscarriage, sepsis infection, yeah. um, and that pulled through. And then it was widely proven on the battlefields in Europe, sure. um, based on Normandy specifically. And, and so what happened then is the biggest, uh, World War II to World War I, the thing that was killing people in battles was infection. It sure. wasn't necessarily the war wounds. So it went from about 18% death rate to 1% death rate simply because of penicillin. Oh. So fast forward to amoxicillin, which was isolated in 1958. Um, actually, I should say real quickly, Dr. Fleming uh, and his group got the Nobel Prize in 1945. Um, and so the interesting thing in Fleming's speech, though, is that with penicillin, we have to be careful with our use because resistance could develop. So we've come up so with... So he warned... He back warned then. it back in 1945. He was astute enough to recognize that it could be a very real problem in the future. And as we look at this, and as we look at how we treat people with antibiotics today, uh, one of the very real, with antimicrobial stewardship, that's what, in my world, as a pharmacist, we see lots yeah. of doctors really trying, you know, where people... You're, I, I you're starting to, I don't know, the big words, Chris. I okay. Mean, All right. It down for All me. right. So we're trying to cut down the use of a, uh, any antibiotic, really, because resistances are developing. Wait, wait, wait. We're, we're getting to, we're jumping here. We went from penicillin got invented and then all of a sudden amoxicillin in 1958. So amoxicillin is a part of penicillin. Yes. And they use it for infections. Correct. Very commonly and it grew and grew and grew and we're still using amoxicillin today. We use it today. But it's, it's funny. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years as a pharmacist and actually the doses of amoxicillin have gone up from my first day in 1995 to where I am right now in 2021, vastly different dosing. So, so you see higher doses to make it useful. For the be same, because same individual or same problem. Because of the resistance of, of to the amoxicillin, well, which let, is a penicillin. Let's, let's back up even sure. one more step. So we've got amoxicillin now. It's working uh, well. We're changing the doses. But what is it primarily used for? An infection from a nail, an infection yeah. from a you cut? Know, or... It's a very versatile drug. So it's going to treat things like pneumonia, UTIs, uh, staph infection, strep infection, uh, ear infections for parents, for children. Sure. So it, it's safe it in pregnancy. Well? Yeah, it works very well okay. when used appropriately and dosed appropriately. I mean, the biggest thing for people is to make sure that when your doctor gives you a prescription, you take it exactly as directed uh, until they tell you to stop. So basically, a lot of people uh, are inclined to want to stop taking the medication after three days, and then they'll save it for later. Better. Yeah, they feel better. Like, I don't need the rest of it. So they'll save it for later when, it, when something invariably comes back. Mm. And then they could be mistreating the uh, infection okay. because it might be not the appropriate bacteria. And then they can, that bacteria, all your bacteria absorbs the antibiotic. And so, uh, and that's why, and we can talk about that with resistance in the food supply and things like that if we want. So but, the big thing about dosage is now your doctor gives it to you, take it all the way as, as prescribed until it, the bottle is gone. And they'll tell you that or the pharmacist. Pharmacist will, will reinforce that. Right. Yes. Okay. So to make sure. So adults, infants. Yeah, Ch kill, everybody, children, everyone can use it. You this. name it. And a, the, I'm assuming the dosage is going to be different from an infant to an adult. Yes, it's, it's be... definitely going to be different. So as as it, you know, so for ear infections in particular, they do a much higher dose of amoxicillin than what they would do for say a skin infection sure. or say a uh, sore throat. So or strep throat. So it just kind of depends, and they always dose that by milligram per kilogram. So they base it on your body weight, sure. particularly with kids. Adults, it's a little bit more standard. So it's a little bit easier to dose as an adult. So this all seems pretty straightforward so far. The doc, you get an infection, yep. very treatable with amoxicillin, yep. follow the directions from the doctor, typically it's successful as, and I've had this myself, it's been a long time. Uh, but like the doctor mentioned 1945, there could be some problems with, over usage, so over to usage speak. and resistance, and that's one of the biggest problems that we face now as a society. I mean, you were looking at what's predicted right now by 2050. They think that actually resistant to antibiotics may actually over that death rate may take overtake the cancer death rate. So that's Wait, not. So you're saying someone has 
an infection, they take amoxicillin, it's not going to be doesn't effective. work. And doesn't it, work anymore. And then the infection is going to take over their body. Why and, doesn't it? Why is it quit working? Well, the bacteria want to live. And so basically mm. what they do is they, they assimilate ways. They've developed enzymatic systems to help to fight against it. So it's, it's kind of... So it kind of mutates that the amoxicillin is no longer effective because of the previous history Correct. of use yep. from person to person, generation to generation. Go ahead. So if I had amoxicillin used on me and so this amox or the bacteria all starts to mutate i'm going to pass that on to my child uh, and they're going to be not no, well, it, does, not be it doesn't work that way it's the bacteria it's it goes from bacteria to bacteria okay. so you have your own normal flora i've got my own normal flora yeah. and so and and cattle and livestock have their own normal flora and so oftentimes you know there's antibiotics in the food chain because they want to keep the herd healthy so, so they're using amoxicillin. Same well, using, cattle. they're using types of penicillin. It's not amoxicillin, but it's okay. a, a penicillin specific for cattle. It's but it's or other. It still will affect us because they the, inject it into the herd. Yep, the so herd. So the bacteria within those cows, you know, it goes all the way down. It gets into the water system. You name it. We're ingesting tons and tons of. You animal. mean because it's injected to the cow, goes into their meat. We eat the meat, so it gets into us, and it's. Kind of the same thing as an injection into yep. us? No, and they excrete things. It goes into the water, and it's in our water supplies, and you name so, it. It's a very widespread problem. So dairy, not, not just meat. No, beef, I'm, we're be, I'm just picking on cows, but it no, could be but anything. It could be, it could be chickens. Pigs, chickens, all, everyone. That, and so this is where uh, people are concerned, well, I better get organic Correct. to avoid. To try and avoid some of that. Avoid taking in the antibiotics yeah. that. The animals yeah, are and even then, even cool. organic farmers have to treat their animals with antibiotics, but it's much less. So, I mean, that's something to be understood. I mean, big commercial farmers tend to use antibiotics just prophylactically to make sure that that herd remains Before healthy. Before there's an infection, they'll use it just to make Is sure. Is it preventative? That, because they got a thousand cows in there. If exactly. one gets um, an infection and it's it can, spread. It can spread. It can be a big right. deal. So right. it's very expensive. Right. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, it, it is not an easy business. I mean, it's, it's not that farmers, you know, they're just trying to indiscriminately do that. I mean, it's their livelihoods. Sure. So, yeah. it, you know, can't blame them. It's just a situation that's arised over the years. I mean, for a while there, it seemed like it was an ingenious idea. Sure. And now we're just learning because these bacteria basically have learned how to develop enzymatic systems to help break down these antibiotics. Right. So they're resistant to it. So it doesn't affect them. So all of a sudden you yeah, give them a shot of penicillin and it's like, why am I not getting better? And that's the fear that we have. And sure. so using antibiotics indiscriminately, you know, when you don't need it, and it's hard because most times you go in and visit a doctor and a doctor, unless they actually take a culture, they aren't going to definitively know. They're going to have a pretty darn good idea because yeah. they have very smart, uh, you know, uh, People that deal with cultures and sensitivities, they, they talk about what the infecting organisms are in the area, and they have a, a, these these infectious disease yeah. people. They, they just don't say, "Oh, it's an infection." No, Here's no. I mean, it's it, it's thought. It's a very it's it's and even more so today. Doctors are being much more selective about their use of uh, infection. So let's say you went in and and you had an ear infection, and, yeah. and your doctor they, they probably actually give you augmentin, but we'll, we're not going to talk about that. But we'll pretend that they're going to give you amoxicillin, sure. and so we're going to give you an eight hundred and seventy five milligram dose twice a day. So then you've got this ear that's killing you. So it's a it's, so if you come into the pharmacy and you go, hey, uh, I need this. And I'm like, okay, Brad, well we're giving you amoxicillin. So what's going on? And you say, I've got a horrible ear infection. Terrible earache. And yeah. It worked really good for my mom. She says I should get this amoxicillin and it's going to be fine. So your doctor uh, agreed with your mother, huh? Well, yeah, she was, she was adamant that I get this amoxicillin and I, cause it's, it's going to take care of the okay. problem. And uh, she argued with him a little bit well, and he gave it to me. I got to say, I've got a smart mom, but I think your, your doctor probably assessed the situation, probably looked at that ear. It was probably pretty red and goopy and you had a fever. Yeah. So, and he made the, the selective decision to go, all right, I think Brad would be a good candidate for this dose of amoxicillin. Sure. So we'd look at it. You're going to take it twice a day. We're going to have you on this for 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that we would, yeah, you know, sometimes it can be a five day course, a seven day course or a 10 day course. It sort of depends on the nature of the infection. Sure. Um, so, and, and a lot of times, Actually, even for otitis, they'd probably only do seven days for you. Um, but sometimes ear infections can be worse because your ears and your sinuses are all kind of interwound right. together. Right. So you may see a prescription for seven to 10 days, depending upon what your clinician believes is most appropriate sure. for you. And so they will prescribe it. Um, the biggest thing with amoxicillin, it's tough on the tummy. So oh. I want to make sure you eat before you get a dose. Oh. Yeah, because you can get a really irritated gut. So it so can cause it. So after you eat. 
Yep. Yeah. So food first, and and because it's a twice a day dose, it's pretty convenient. We're going to tell you to take it after breakfast and after supper. And you might say, well, Chris, it's three in the afternoon. What do I do? Do I get both doses in today? And on day one, a lot of times we're going to tell you to get both doses no. in. So let's say you're up around 10 o'clock. I'd tell you to get that second dose in because as we kind of put a more aggressive loading dose in there to try and get a head start on getting those nasty bacteria kind of calmed down. But then the next day we want you to resume to a uniform dosing pattern so that we keep a good concentration level of drug in your system sure. to aggressively manage and fight that yeah. infection. You know, I was making that point with the mother. I was pretending. Oh. And I was just trying to get oh, to I the know. point where sometimes – the doctors kind of may get uh, pressure from the patient or the family member that it worked in the past and the doctors gonna, might say, because of history of used it before that you don't want to use it all the time. Right? Correct. Yeah. And, that's and that's, the doctor may say, no, we're not going to use it. And then you got a frustrated patient, but yes. And that's, and that's one of the things that doctors find this dilemma, I think on a day-to-day -day basis sure. really as to what's the most effective choice. But now we've got, you know, most hospitals and clinics have what they call antimicrobial stewardship programs in place mm -hmm. where they, they go through lots of education and, and doctors already have tons and tons and hours of education. So they know, when it's appropriate and when it's not. Right. And, and even they, they generally are not going to succumb to patient uh, call in their shot, so to speak. Sure. I mean, I'm going to go in, I'm going to, I'm going to take some amoxicillin because it worked great for my kid. I mean, it might be because there's maybe a genetic component there, but yeah. if there's an allergy in place or if there, you yeah. know, maybe it's not appropriate or there's certain drugs that could interfere with that. You know, there's a lot of reasons why a clinician is going to maybe choose something differently, but okay. for the purposes of our discussion, we're going to say you're not on any drugs that are going to interfere like a blood thinner uh, we're going to pretend that you're healthy otherwise and you have no allergies. But let's say you have a history of using amoxicillin like me. I maybe I used it quite a few times in my past. Would that be a reason not to continue to use it? Yes, so that absolutely. Becomes there? Exactly. That's one of the biggest things that we watch for in the pharmacy is usually the guideline that that we that we've seen put in place is you don't want to repeat the same drug within at least 30 days. And I think they're getting even more stringent about that. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends because you know, with sinusitis, that's a really tough infection to treat to begin with. Sure. And sometimes it takes a much longer course of antibiotics, even 2 weeks and 3 weeks. Uh, so those are long courses of antibiotics. And you know, an antibiotic goes in there indiscriminately. It kills your good bacteria ah, and your bad bacteria, sure. which is, uh, so it makes it tough. That's why people have digestive woes when they're taking antibiotics yeah. because their good bacteria got killed off. That's what helps digest our food. And, and that's real. They're really talking about that. I'm reading a book. They're talking about the, the gut, the, the microbiome. The, bo the, biome. the biome of the gut. Yeah. Yes. Which is good bacteria. Correct. Uh, which, you know, 20 years ago, I just figured every all bacteria was good until I start, you know, got in the health field. Yeah. Well, I mean, all bacteria, I mean, and that's what happens with an infection is, you know, it's, it's all about, it's like checks and balances, like with our government. I mean, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you know, we have billions and billions of bacteria all over our bodies at any given point at any different point in our body. Sure. And when it gets, your immune system has an insult, something gets overgrown, that's when the, the bacteria takes advantage. It's like, hey. I got a weakness here. This sure. is my chance to really proliferate and get big and get nasty. Sure. And that's why, you know, in the case of like your ear infection, you know, it found a spot behind that eardrum. The eustachian tube wasn't draining properly. It clogged it up and it's a nice warm breeding environment. And yeah. Yeah. boom, it grew bad and, and, and you had the infection sure. necessitating the antibiotic. Right. Right. So yeah, repeating it over and over is not a successful plan. Just because it worked for you the last time doesn't mean it's the most appropriate choice. Sure. A lot of times physicians will recognize that and they will go in a different direction and select a different, all effective antibiotic right, right and then but sometimes they'll have to go let's say the second antibiotic didn't work as effectively for whatever reason they may have to go back to we'll say amoxicillin right, in this particular case right. so it depends so there's a lot of work that goes on i mean if it was easy everybody would be doing it right, right? And so it's, it's it's definitely a challenge sure. for sure well i think that uh we covered a lot of ground there from the the, the, the history it's amazing how things in life and in history, accidents happen and something incredible. Oh, yeah. I mean, it does. <laughs> um, I mean, it's changed us. You know, or develops from it. So, yeah. Yeah, amoxicillin sounds like a, a good drug. It sounds like you got to be careful with it and, you know, understand how to take it and when to and when not to take it and, you know, what the doctors have to take in consideration. Yep. And so, I mean, a lot of, you know, going forward, I mean, we're going to have to have these drug companies start doing more research on new sure. antimicrobials. Otherwise, I think we're going to, and really in a very short period of time, could history-wise, we could have some very big issues ahead yeah. of us. Well, you we, we said 
2050, so it's yeah, 30 that's not, years. That's not that far away. I suppose. 29 it all years takes is time. pretty quick. Yeah, things, it's pretty quick. Things happen fast. So very good. I appreciate everyone listening. I hope you uh, learned a lot and you feel comfortable with your amoxicillin and uh, enjoy the week. Thanks, guys.